take your Bible out now. And if you would, let's uh, turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. The book of Hebrews chapter 12. While you're turning there, I'm sure I don't have to uh, remind us that we are certainly living in the last days. We're living in what the Bible calls perilous times, dangerous times. But you know what? We're also living in a time of what I think is a soft age. There's just a softness that uh, pervades our culture. Uh, no one wants any hardship in their life. No one wants to suffer. Not, no, Christians don't want it. I understand that. That's human nature. But it seems as if it just is more prevalent in our day than it ever has been before. Which leads me to say this. As believers, when we live our lives, we have to live our lives by faith. When I say that, when I say that believers live a life of faith, what I mean is that we are to live lives that are completely dependent upon God all the time. Not just in the difficult times, but all the time. As we move ahead daily in our lives, doing the will of God, which is what we're supposed to be involved in, we have to live by faith. In fact, we are told in the chapter just before 12, in chapter 11, the importance of of living by faith. Let me pause a moment and let's by faith look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you again that we can come into your presence. Thank you that you are a totally dependable God. You tell us to depend upon you, to place our trust, our faith in you. And you don't mock us, you meet us and you respond to the faith of your people. And so, Lord, we pray tonight that you would teach us, teach us how to walk by faith, because we're not supposed to walk by sight. We're supposed to walk by faith. So teach us how that's done. Show us from this portion of Scripture this evening. And I pray that the end result would be we'd exalt you we'd lift you up, and as a fringe benefit of that, our lives would be blessed and enriched by you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the sixth verse of chapter 11, actually go back to verse 5 of chapter 11, because here is the second person in what we call the uh, Heroes Hall of Faith. We learn about this man, Enoch. Not a whole lot. This is the only thing that, that uh, other than Genesis uh, 5 and verse 24, this is the only thing really that the New Testament says about him other than I think there is an indirect reference to him by um, Jude or 2 Peter, where it talks about the prophecy of Enoch. But look at what we read here in 11.5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. For, verse 6, or but without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How to live by faith? Well, before we even talk about how to, let's talk about the importance of it. And it's stated here in 
this sixth verse. To live by faith is important not only to you, but it's important to God. And Enoch's life is a reflection of how to live by faith. And he was living by faith in very evil times. He was living by faith just before God destroyed the earth with that flood. And he says about this man that he pleased God. I wonder, I wonder if you have a desire in your heart to please God. I would assume you do or you wouldn't be here. I assume even if a person would be watching via the internet that you wouldn't be watching something like this unless you had some desire in your heart to please God. You know what it takes to please God? It takes walking with God. And you walk with God by faith. In fact, that sixth verse tells us how important it is that believers walk by faith. It pleases God. It gratifies God. Think about it, that when we step out into the, doing the will of God, when we walk by faith, when we walk with God by faith, it totally gratifies him. God is gratified when we depend upon him, when we completely depend upon. This is a powerful statement that is said about Enoch in that fifth verse. He is a man that God states, pleases me. He pleased me. And you and I can please God too. You can please God if you will walk with God. And in order to do that, you have to walk by faith. You want to please God? Walk with him. That gratifies him. But look at El, look, look what else is said in that sixth verse about the importance of faith. Not only does it gratify God, but it really testifies about God. It says in that sixth verse, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Now, obviously, that refers to the fact that you have to believe that God exists, but it's not only believing in his existence. What that phrase means is that you believe all the claims about God. You believe the promises of God, and you believe that what he promises, he has the power to completely fulfill also. You believe that he is. It is to testify when you walk with God by faith. It is to testify that you believe all the claims about God. Not only that, but verse 6 says, you also must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's two facets to that that I see. Number one, if you believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, then you believe that God is nearby. You believe that God's always there with you and that he is completely aware of what happens to you in your life today and every day. The importance of walking by faith is not only it gratifies God, it testifies of God, but it, it says that God's nearby as well. And he knows what's going on. But also, if you believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, then it's not only that you believe that God's always present with you and knows all about your happenings, but that God also cares. <laughs> And he is involved in your personal daily life. 
he's occupied with you, with us, with his people. And we're occupied with him. Walking with God requires walking by faith. And walking with God, he's occupied with you and you're occupied with him. He rewards that diligent pursuit of him in our daily lives. How do you pursue God? He is a reward of them that diligently seek or pursue him. How do you hunt God down? How do you pursue God? Well, obviously that requires some time. It requires time with God. I wonder how much time you've had with God today. Oh, you said, well, you know, I've read a chapter of scripture. Is that it? You've only spent time with God because you read some of the Bible today? You said, well, you know, I've I said some prayers. That's it? To diligently seek God is not simply to have a devotional time in the morning when you get up or when you go to bed. It is a constant pursuit throughout the day. It's time spent with God. To pursue God is to speak with each other. Let him speak with you and you speak with him. It's a communication with walking with God is making God your confidant. You know what a confidant is? A confidant is your closest associate or friend, your, your best friend, your most intimate friend. A confidant is the person that you can always totally depend upon. That's what it means to diligently seek him. It means that you are occupied with him. That uh, he's occupied with you, you're occupied with him. That's the importance of walking by faith. I asked you to turn originally to the 12th chapter of Hebrews. And we read in the first verse these interesting words. Wherefore, after he has gone through this list of men and women in this chapter of faith in action, he says this, seeing we also are compassed about or surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are these witnesses? Well, I think they are the people mentioned in chapter 11. Some of them are named and some are unnamed. They are a cloud of witnesses. I guess one illustration we could uh, think about to give us some idea is going to a baseball game or any other sporting event where you are a, a spectator and you're in the stands and the game's going on, on the, on the field or on the court. You're watching the game. You're a spectator in the game. That's the picture here, that these heroes of faith mentioned in chapter 11 are like spectators and they see what's going on in the scene realm. They're in the unseen realm. They are watching what's going on in the scene realm on earth. They're watching our lives to see faith evidenced in our lives and through our, they want, they see us walking by faith with the Lord. Those lives that are featured there in chapter 11 are illustrative. That is, they are their lives are testimonies of the supernatural life of faith. You want evidence of what it means to walk by faith? Here it is in chapter 11. All of these lives, these are human beings like you and I. 
these are, are, are normal people. There was not many of them were uh, above average. Maybe some were even below average. But they are illustrative of lives that testify of the supernatural life of faith, where laws of nature are actually suspended when they de depend upon God, when they walk by faith. Uh, a sea opens up, dry land uh, becomes possible. Uh, massive walls of fortified cities collapse defying the very laws of nature. Powerful kingdoms are subdued. Great enemies are defeated. And uh, intensive fire is extinguished. Mountains are moved, you might say. What we have here in chapter 11, if you're with me tonight, is evidence of mountain-moving faith. Remember Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Here is evidence of mountain-moving faith. This is really the evidence of walking by faith that we have recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 in these heroes. It's illustrative. But look at the incentive that we're given in this first verse of chapter 12. Seeing we are surrounded by these unseen spectators that are mentioned in this 11th chapter, let us who are being watched, you might say, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or endurance, because it's not a 100-yard dash. It's a 26-mile marathon, the Christian life. Let us run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us. Here is the incentive then. These heroes of the faith, these uh, great, this great cloud of witnesses, is the incentive to keep on running. That's what it means when it says, let us run. Let us keep on running. And we do that, he says, by stripping off all that would hinder us, all that would hinder self, that which would weigh you down and hold you back or easily trip you up, whether it be central, essential gratification, uh, misplaced values, uh, too deep earthly ties, or self-pity, or just a plain refusal to go forward in the will of God because of your unbelief. Keep on running. There is the incentive in this cloud of witnesses that is evidenced here. But I'll tell you where the evidence is really intensive. Look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus is the climax, and he is the companion of the faith life. He is the only one that has ever lived the life of faith 100% successfully. And you can only live a successful life of faith by being Christ-focused. The faith life is looking to Jesus. It's being totally dependent upon, on, uh, upon God and, and totally dependent upon Jesus, who successfully lived the life already. And through the Holy Spirit, he is... Notice what it says, the author and finisher of our faith. What that means is, through the Holy Spirit, he prompts faith in us. He prompts God dependence in us. And then he performs that God dependence through us. He's the author and the finisher of how to walk by faith. It's him. It's Jesus. It's the spirit of Jesus who is the initiator and the perfecter of the faith life. 
And then verses uh, 5 through 12 give us guidance on how to walk by faith. It's interesting to me, very clear, that the life of faith, walking by faith, walking with the Lord, it includes discipline. Look at what he says in verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, scourges every son that he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons or children. For what child, what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? He says in verse 9, our earthly fathers, they corrected us and we respected them. How much more shall we not be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For our earthly fathers, for a few days, they chastened us after their own pleasure. For uh, But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. And no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. It's grievous. But nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. And it's so important because look at verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness or sanctification, same word, without which no man shall see the Lord. So very clearly, the walking by faith includes discipline. When he talks about the chastening of the Lord. That word chastening literally means child training. Now, some of you here are parents. You know exactly what child training involves. And, and uh, we can't overlook the fact that child training not only is that you direct them, you guide them and instruct them, but there comes a time where you punish them, where you spank them. And he says that very, you know, sometimes I think uh, we we soft soap the chastening of the Lord. Oh, all our punishment was taken by the Lord on the cross. That's true for sin. But that doesn't mean that there is not scourgings that God brings to us. You know what? There's a proverb, and you probably have heard of it. There's a proverb that says, if you as a parent do not corporally uh, punish your child. If you refuse to spank your child, it shows you hate your kid. <laughs> it shows you hate your child, not that you love them, that you love yourself too much, and so you won't spank them. God spanks his children. So I'm not going to soft soap this passage. It tells us that. And the guidance that he gives us, it's direction, it's instruction, but it's also at times a good old-fashioned spanking that God gives his children. He does not do it by because he's venting anger against us. But when God spanks his children, he's, it's, a, it's, it's an expression of his love. He's expressing uh, love and fostering spiritual maturity in us and preventing us from sinful ruin. You know, if, if a child is stubborn and, and determines to do something that you know is going to bring them bodily harm, you do whatever it takes to stop them from repeating that action. If you have to beat the daylights out of them, you do. You know what I mean by that. I'm not talking about abuse. We're, we're, again, we're in such a soft culture that everything is, is viewed as abusive. It's not abusive to spank a child in love. And that's what God does with his children. And he does it to foster spiritual maturity and to prevent his children from ruining them, their lives through sin. But there are two very different responses that we read of here to God's discipline in our lives. There is, of course, the accepting of it. 
In verses 5 through 14, he's telling us that the life of faith includes accepting God's discipline. You want to walk by faith? Then you got you got to realize it involves God's discipline. And that discipline includes him spanking you. And uh, you have to accept that if you're going to walk by faith, you're going to walk with God. Now, I remember being spanked by my dad and uh, and thinking afterwards, you know, I hate him. You know, as a kid, you experienced that? I hate him. Can't stand him. But, you know, afterwards I got over it and uh, I went back to loving him. And, of course, as I grew and uh, and grew into adulthood, I, I recognized clearly why he why he did what he did. And uh, it increased my love for him as uh, I look back on that. But the fact of the matter is, if you're going to walk with God and walk by faith, it's going to mean that you accept God's discipline in your life. God's discipline is the way that he ministers to his children. It's good for you. It's good for us because it's the way that he corrects us. And it's the way that he protects us from ruining our lives. And verse 14, it's the way that he sanctifies your life. Or verse 11, it's the way that you become the partaker of his sanctifying holiness. It's the way that he sanctifies your life, which is a must for heaven, according to verse 14. So don't despair. Don't complain. Don't quit. But realize this is a part of God's loving care for your healthy spiritual de uh, development. Very important. A life of faith. It includes accepting God's discipline. The wrong response is in verse 15. It's rejecting it. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It's a wrong response to God's discipline. And when you wrongly respond to the discipline of God, to God spanking you as his child, if you respond wrongly, it can cause a poison bitterness in your heart, which spreads its corrupting influence. Let me tell you, I've learned, instead of asking God why, I've learned to ask God, where do you want to take me, Lord? Where do you want to take me? He wants to take us to higher spiritual ground. You know, there's no such thing as middle ground in the Christian life. Either you're moving forward in faith or you're slipping back in unbelief. We have uh, a big Bible in our home that has some interesting pictures in it, artists' drawings, beautiful pictures. One of which is uh, one of my favorites is a picture of the prophet Daniel. He's in the lion's den. He's an old man, and he's standing like this, and he's with his head, his hands in front of him, his head looked up like he's talking to God, and behind him are all these lions looking at him. He's not even bothering with them. They're looking at him like that, and he's looking up to God. That is a great picture of the life of faith. That's how to walk by faith. This is what walking by faith, walking with God, which is walking by faith, is all about. It's important. There's evidence of the greatness of it. And God will guide you in it.